Okay, so moving on to chapter 20, Enabling Internet Connectivity with NAT. Um, this is going to go over the, the basics of network address translation. Um, in the book, it basically went over basics and then goes over the uh, configuring NAT with the SDM. I'm not going to cover the SDM portion. Um, I, there's a chance if you take the ICD-1 that you may have some SDM stuff, but uh, I've, I've repeated my opinion on the SDM before. I, I think it's... Um, it's not the nitty gritty. It's not for hardcore Cisco guys, and anyone taking this course needs to be a hardcore Cisco guy. So, on the exam, especially if you do the ICD2 or the full CCNA, you're going to have to configure NAT from the command line anyway. So that's what we're going to focus on in Chapter 21. But the, the SDM configuration, I'm going to avoid uh, at least in this chapter. So NAT concepts. NAT is used to map one IP address to another uh, in its most you know purest, simple form. Uh, NAT has extended the life of IPv4 years beyond what was thought possible. Um, whenever NAT was created, IPv6 was only a draft at that time. Uh, we would have ran out of IPv4 addresses a long, long time ago uh, without the wonderful capabilities of NAT. Nearly every network in the world uses NAT in some capacity, so it's, it is a very important topic. You do need to be familiar with it and understand it at a pretty fundamental level. Cisco and the IETF developed NAT back in 1994. Um, theoretically, NAT can map over 60,000 devices to a single IP, but practically, router resources are going to be exhausted way before you reach that limit. Like, you're not going to have enough CPU, memory, and bandwidth to support 60,000 devices on your average uh, your average NAT router um, before you get anywhere near 60,000. So, but it, hypothetically, it's a it's a nice. Uh, Nice to know that you could potentially uh, map that many devices. Network address translation translates one IP to another, as we said before. Uh, there are three private IP uh, ranges commonly used, which will not route through the public internet. Um, it's not that they won't route, it's because ISP block their routing uh, with ACLs because they know that they're going to be reused over and over. So. The, you've got a class A, 10.0.0.0, .0 .0 .0 through 10.255.255.255. 255. Class B, 172.16.00 through 172.31.255.255. And class C, 192.168.0.0 through 192.168.255.255. These different size blocks can be effectively used for companies of different sizes. So, you know, you can see you have less uh, IPs in this range. Those would probably be smaller sites medium businesses, and then very large networks can use the 10 dot block. Of course, you can always break these down into um, smaller subnets as needed. So, and here's just kind of a, a real quick overview of exactly that. So, you got all your large companies, A, B, and C. They've got these different uh, public addresses, 200.1.1.12, 11, 10, etc. They're all using the same 10 dot uh, 0, 0, 0, slash 8 range. Um, but since they're being translated, the public internet only sees them as this 200.1.1.12 uh, address with different port numbers, so you don't have to worry about overlapping IP address space. Same thing for these medium businesses. You know, these two right here, both using the 172.16.00 range, no overlap because they're being translated. And for smaller businesses, 192.168.0/24. Uh, so there's there's three types of NATs, uh, NAT configurations we're going to go over: um, static NAT, dynamic NAT, and NAT overload. We're going to start with uh, with static NAT. Um, static NAT is the simplest form of NAT, and is sometimes called one-to-one -one NAT because it maps a single public IP to a single private IP. Generally, this is often used when there is an internal server at an office that needs to be accessed from the public internet. Um, another common type of static mapping is associating specific TCP or UDP port numbers to a private IP on the network. So for instance, if you had a web server, um, you've got a single public IP, you've got a web server that's on a private address, you can set up static NAT to forward any requests to ports 80 and 443 to that, um, to that web server. Um, this can also be implemented for port redirection if your ISP blocks certain ports. So let's say your ISP is one of those uh, terrible ISPs that wants you to prevent wants to prevent you from setting up a web server um, at your home. You can set it up so that requests go to port 8080, which is not blocked, and then are redirected to port 80 uh, with NAT. <coughs> um, in the attached example, the network has three servers with three separate static NAT mappings. You can see them all over there. 
each server uh, can subsequently be accessed using the map static. So you got 192.168.1.1, uh, 200.1.1.1 is mapping to that, dot two is mapping to 192.168.1.2, and 200.1.1.3 is mapping to 192.168.1.3. So you've got your, your web server, your DNS server, and email server all statically mapped to a separate public IP each. Uh, dynamic NAT, <coughs> I, I want to say that dynamic NAT is one of the, the lesser used forms. Um, it's not entirely true. I, I made the assumption that it was uh, lesser used, so I didn't have to worry as much about it on the, the CCNA exam. And sure enough, that was the NAT question that I actually got was uh, in regards to configuring dynamic NAT. So make sure you do know each of the three versions. Don't just focus on static NAT and NAT overload because you can definitely get a question on any of the three um, or a simulation, as was my case. If you have many hosts that need to be translated, Dynamic NAT enables you to define a pool of addresses to be translated as well as a pool that they are translated to and creates one-to-one -one, uh, mappings dynamically. This is not the same as allowing multiple hosts to all use the same IP, NAT overloading, which we're going to get into in a minute. Dynamic NAT just makes many one-to-one -one maps without you having to statically assign each one. So you got to, you know, say you had a big pool of IPs, public IPs, and a big pool of private IPs. Um, dynamic NAT you could set up so that it would just randomly set those up as needed so that you didn't have to set up the granular uh, configurations that you would if you statically mapped each one to uh, the other. And then NAT overload, uh, or commonly referred to as PAD or port address translation, um, is the most common and well-known form of NAT. It allows you to map many hosts to a single private IP, excuse me, that should have been single uh, public IP by dynamically assigning each host to a port number. Um, the router then knows that if it receives a packet to the, uh, the public IP and a certain destination port number, it should forward that packet to the private host mapped to that port. Uh, NAT overload is effectively the, the form of NAT which is responsible for extending IPv4 well beyond its years because it would allow you to basically have one public IP and let's say you had a block of you know a thousand private IPs on your LAN, well you only need that one public IP to use all those private addresses so you don't have to have a thousand uh, public IPs and use up some of the IPv4 range. Um, and so here's kind of a, a quick little example of how how PAT or PAT or NAT overload works. So NAT is set up on this NAT router here. You got a few different hosts on this side. Uh, this host right here, it's sending a, a request to, uh, all these are sending requests to port 80, but they also have a, a source port number. So in this case, from 192.168.0.66, it sent a, a request to, for example, cram2.com on port 80 with a source port of 1812. So the NAT router sees that and it sets up a, a mapping uh, for port 1812 to map to this IP whenever the request comes back in. Same thing for each of these. Uh, you know, This one's going to cisco.com with a, uh, a source port number of 5440. Down here, source port number of 2112 to get to Google. And it sets up a, a mapping for each of those. All the same public address, but different port numbers corresponding to the different routers that initially set up those requests. So I said this before, but make sure you know the three types of NAT and how they are used. You know, you, here's just a quick little table. Static NAT is one-to-one -one IP address translations. Dynamic NAT is many-to-many -many IP address translations. And NAT overload or PAT, many-to-one IP address translations.